Uh, so today uh, uh, we're here uh, for the colloquium and we have a visit of uh, Dr. Mike Alvaro, uh, who, who obtained his first degree uh, at the University of Birmingham, and then he went uh, to Manchester University to get his PhD in 1969, studying uh, photo, uh, photo production and neutral chaos. And after his PhD, he went to CERN, where he got a CERN fellowship. And at, at the time, uh, he carried out some of the some, you know, um, first experiments on scattering uh, measurements of polarized target. First, he worked on the ISR, the intersecting storage rings. And then, uh, he worked on the uh, axial field spectrometer, which are two uh, very important uh, experiments. And during this period, he made uh, two very important discoveries. One is the discovery of high mass diffraction that we're still uh, studying. And then at the AFS, he uh, co-discovered uh, jets with high ET, which is also an important topic that we still uh, do today in collider experiments. Uh, after CERN, he, was, uh, um, he, he went to, uh, uh, to obtain a professorship at the University of Stockholm in 1989, and he stayed there for a, for a few years where people were preparing for the Large Hadron Collider. And he played an important role in promoting the LHC uh, during the very first stages. After that period, he went to, uh, he came here to the US when he uh, joined Fermilab as a research scientist, and he's been working there for over 25 years. First with the CDF experiment, where he worked for proton spectrometers, and uh, he's one of the world experts uh, in this type of detectors. And then after CDF, uh, he joined CMS, and he's been working uh, for several years. Uh, first also following the leadership of proton spectrometers, and he was one of the uh, key persons on the, on the studies of Higgs uh, production, exclusive Higgs productions, where at the time uh, people were very excited to, to see whether the Higgs can be discovered in these exclusive uh, productions. And, and uh, during those years, in to around 2005, is when uh, I made uh, Dr. Albro. And uh, you know, uh, he's uh, very enthusiastic, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's an honor for me to introduce him. Uh, and I also want to say a few words about his other activities. He's, uh, he has done uh, numerous activities in outreach programs uh, in Chicago and the Midwest. Uh, in 2005, he got the Director Award from Fermilab for his outstanding contributions uh, in outreach programs. And he actually reached more than 10,000 students over almost 90 uh, high school students. With my colleagues. With well, my you colleagues. Well, you yeah. colleagues. <laughs> but you, you led this uh, program, uh, and he, he was awarded this, uh, uh, this, this award and has participated in many exhibitions. And just a couple of weeks ago, he retired from Fermilab, and, um, uh, and now he's an emeritus uh, physicist staff. Uh, and he's here to discuss about uh, uh, exciting the vacuum and why the vacuum is more than more than nothing, or always nothing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, right. So, I'm going to be talking about what I call exciting the vacuum. Uh, it's not nothing. In fact, uh, this talk could have been much ado about nothing, but somebody already, already got that title, so I had to drop <laughs> that. Um, starting from the ISR, which, if you're young, you probably think this means uh, initial state radiation. That's what people think now at the LHC, but for us it meant intersecting storage rings, which was the first Hadron-Hadron Collider, the first PP Collider at CERN, starting in 1971, and I happened to be there in the early days of that. And then at the Tevatron, we moved on to studying the same sort of process, but now uh, moving and producing leptons and photons and charmonium states out of the vacuum in some sense, and now moving on to the LHC, where the, the possibility is there of exciting the Higgs field in the vacuum to make real Higgs bosons this way. That we may or may not do, but in any case, we can produce W pairs out of the vacuum and maybe something unknown. Um, so basically, the sort of physics reaction that uh, is covering these is PP collides, or PP bar, same sort of thing, or, and, and produces two protons flying apart, going down the vacuum pipe, where they can be detected way down, far down, uh, but producing a state that I call X as a simple system completely measured in the central region. By the way, you can ask questions during, I think. I'll have to repeat them, but if you want to ask questions, it's okay. 
So here's my outline. I talk about the vacuum, an experimental viewpoint. I just hit it. This is a very elementary sort of introduction, nothing very deep theoretical, but uh, with hitting it with different hammers. Uh, electromagnetic hammer, which means photons, or strong, which means gluons, or weak, which means W bosons. Different exposure times. And I want us to think about the shortest exposure time, which is the Planck time, up to the longest, which is the age of the universe. And I'm going to try and have on one slide this whole length of time spans. Experiments observing it with electromagnetic eyes, meaning probing the vacuum with photons, and then with strong eyes, looking for these particles we call blue glue balls, um, states, hadron states with no valence quarks in, just gluons, combining these two to make it's called photoproduction, which some of you here, if you're at the LHC, are doing with proton lead collisions and so on. Onto the LHC, where uh, we are using also weak eyes, exciting W loops, and potentially exciting the Higgs field. So we all heard from our ancient Greek philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, nature abhors a vacuum. Nature, <laughs> really? Actually, <laughs> the vacuum contains essentially all of physics. If we understood the vacuum on a really small scale, then inside that box of vacuum is all of fundamental physics. And in fact, vacuum is essentially everything. Matter is a very small part of it. Um, an early experiment on the vacuum was, of course, this experiment in 1650, Otto von Guericke, who uh, put these um, Magdeburg spheres, these two half shells together and pump, pump them out with a vacuum pump that they had. And then, of course, the common wisdom, the vacuum sucks these things together. In fact, of course, the vacuum doesn't suck them together. It's actually the tiny atoms of the atmosphere pushing in from the outside. And even teams of horses, in this case, eight horses trying to pull apart, couldn't beat, could not beat those tiny atoms hitting from the outside. Of course, there's lots of atoms and there's strength in numbers. But this was an early thing, and people tend to think the vacuum sucks, whereas, of course, it's not the vacuum sucking, but it's other things like the atmosphere pushing. Atoms are emptier than most people imagine. Typically, you see diagrams of atoms like this. I've even seen a NASA brochure that had a picture of an atom like this. Even something like this. And if you believe atoms look like this with a nucleus nearly as big as the atom, you could believe in cold fusion. But... <laughs> Even the Atomic Energy Commission di uh, logo here, which has a, a nucleus and electrons going around it, well, it's better, but it's not anything like the real atom, where you know that um, if you magnified the hydrogen atom to the size of this house, then uh, I've lost my laser, so that's probably all right. I would use a stick. Um, that the, at the nucleus, the proton, this is much smaller than this. In fact, it's like a pinhead sitting on those on the shelf there. And you know this because you remember, or should remember, that the typical size of an atom is about 10 to the minus 8 centimeters, whereas the typical size of a nucleus is about 10 to the minus 13. So that's a factor of 10 to the 5, which is 0.2 millimeters compared with 20 meters. So if this is 20 meters, a pinhead of 0.2 milli millimeters is, is the size of the nucleus in the middle. So essentially, the atom is all, is all empty space, or rather magnetic, uh, electromagnetic fields. So when you realize, I mean, that's linear dimensions, of course. Volume-wise, it's 10 to the minus 15. So the volume of an atom that is covered, that is taken by, by matter in the form of protons, forgetting electrons, they're point light, but is 10 to the minus 15. So um, I have a box, and, and I like to open the box and let the vacuum out. Oh, and <laughs> let hair in. So this is a little box of matter. OK, a little box. It's a cute little box from my daughter's wedding, actually, but never mind. Um, and it's full of air, but that really means it's essentially full of nothing except electromagnetic fields. The matter of volume is in air, it's 10 to the minus 18 in this, in this box. And in, in copper, it's, of course, denser, so um, the, the, the nucleons can't take 5 to the minus 15. So how could we get a perfect vacuum? Could we ever get a perfect vacuum? Well, just imagine how you could do that. Take a little box, the smaller the better. Remove all the nucleons and electrons from outside that box. And that you can imagine actually doing. But you'll have 
microwaves sitting in there, unless it's at absolute zero of temperature or very cold, it doesn't have to be absolute zero, just cool it down so that thermal microwaves don't fit in there. The wavelength, uh, uh, that, that, uh, the wavelength has to fit in there has to be smaller than the box. So you could imagine cooling it down. Now, um, you would have made radioactivity, but you can make a thick shield with no radioactivity to kill X-rays and gamma rays. You're doing quite well, but you have cosmic rays that come through. But you can choose a time window when no high-energy cosmic rays are going through. Now, neutrinos, of course, damn them, because you can't really stop them. And there are trillions going through per second. And they would be bright if you had weak eyes, but, of course, they're invisible to electromagnetic eyes, that is the ones we have. But let's forget about the neutrinos. What about pionic, gluonic fields? Well, they're there on the walls, um, but they don't penetrate in very far. So uh, we can forget about them. And then you have a gravitational field in there. But imagine letting it just float in space, OK, so that you can avoid having gravitational fields in there. And then you can say, well, are we there yet? Have we now got an empty box, a box of vacuum? Well, it's a nice try, but at least two reasons why it's not empty. <laughs> and one is that you know that uh, Professor Higgs and others said that there's a potential, usually called a vacuum expectation value, but it's like a scalar field everywhere through space. And that's why, I'm not going to go into the detail, but that's why an electron or a muon or here or in some distant galaxy have the same mass, and they know what mass to have, even if you don't have them there to start with. If you take two photons, which don't have mass, collide two photons, and create a pair of electrons or a pair of muons. And when they come out of that collision, they've got mass, and the right mass. So uh, if there's really nothing, how could they possibly know what mass to have? So this field actually somehow tells them to have a particular mass. So how can we define the vacuum anyway if it's not the absence of any stuff? So you could say, well, I define it to be the lowest possible energy state. Well, um, as you know, Professor Heisenberg said that zero energy, absolutely zero energy, doesn't make sense unless you have an infinite exposure time because of his uncertainty relation. Here's Heisenberg on a German postage stamp, uh, delta P, delta Q. I don't know why it's not delta X, but anyway, about Planck's constant. And the conjugate thing is delta E, energy momentum, space time, also, so for a small time, you have a big uncertainty in the energy. And to get zero energy, absolutely zero, I'm sort of stretching the point in a way, you need an infinite exposure time. So here I talk about blinking and anti-blinking. So a blink is, you know, when you had your eyes open, you suddenly close them and open them again. Anti-blink is keeping them closed and then opening them for a short time. And that's, I call it anti-blink. And this is meant to be a blank transparency because if you imagine looking into a, looking into a block, you don't see anything, right? Because you're not anti-blinking <coughs> shortly enough. Or if you look in a box, if you look in for a short and shorter time, you start to see things popping into existence and out of existence in the, in the vacuum. Um, virtual particles that are there if you take a very short exposure time, depending on whether you look with photons or gluons or, or, or whatever. So here's, um, here's the, the Higgs... Uh, Professor Higgs and his uh, original paper here where he talks about xerons and vacuons, of course, he didn't call it Higgs bosons, but, uh, but there uh, you know, one can read this uh, about these state, these xerons must indeed be present in Lorentz invariant field theories and which blah, blah, blah. So uh, I put this there. You can look at it later if you care to. A second possible reason why the vacuum is not empty, apart from the Higgs field, is axions. So Axions are sort of particles thought to, in the standard model, they, there's no reason why they should not be there. In fact, they, they, should, they, they should be there as a result of a symmetry um, uh, to do with CP violation. Now, um, there's a parameter in, in, in the vacuum called theta. A parameter, it's an angle, basically. It can be anywhere between 0 and 2 pi, and we don't know, know what it is, but it must be very close to 0 because this would give a CP violation on neutrons, and that could give an electric dipole moment of neutrons. We know experimentally that the electric dipole moment of a neutron, that means positive on the North Pole and negative on the South Pole, or vice versa, is less than 2.9 10 to the minus 26 electron centimeters. That's electron charge times centimeters. 
And that's a pretty small number. In fact, it's like one micron. That should be one micro rad micron, not mu mu, one mu m, divided by the radius of the Earth. In other words, if you took, if you took two superimposed Earths, one positive charge and one negative charge, and you just shifted them apart by a micron, then that would have it would have this electric dipole moment. Now, so it's pretty small. Now, um, we don't know really if axions are there, but one looks for them because they can couple to two photons. And an experiment that was done, they break a symmetry called petri quin, quin symmetry, and that can give a mass non-zero to the axion. And the axion can couple to two photons. An experiment was done at Fermilab called light shining through walls. You, you take a photon, a laser, for example, and see if it can come out through a wall um, of matter, opaque, normally opaque, in the presence of a magnetic field. The magnetic field, of course, is virtual photons, and the photon coming in from the laser can interact with the virtual photon for the magnetic field and convert itself to an axion, which can pass through the wall like a neutrino can pass through the wall, and then on the other side, it can convert back to a photon, so you can see through walls with light. Well, the experiment at Fermilab didn't see anything. They're now looking to see if they can see axions coming from the center of the sun, where they could be produced by photons in the magnetic fields in the center of the sun. And as you may know, we actually can see the sun through the Earth with neutrinos, with neutrino eyes. So Super Kamio Candy is a big tank of water in Japan under a mountain with hundreds of thousands of photomultipliers. And they see neutrinos interacting in this water coming from the sun. And this is an image by plotting where the neutrinos came from on the sky and converting it to sun-centric uh, coordinates. Uh, this is an image of the sun seen through the Earth. Wow, that's pretty, pretty cool. Well, so they're trying to look to see if they can see axions coming that way. But could this be part of dark matter? Um, it's a question that we haven't yet answered. We know that there's, I mean, if they exist and they've got some mass, then they're there uh, as part of dark matter, but maybe a small part. Um, I just put this here as a sort of a, a side, really, about instantons, which are not particles specifically, but just a thought that if you have such a, an entity, object, massive thing, that decays to every particle of the up table, electron, muon, tau, three u's, three c's, and three t's, another one that decays to all the down particles, and then you let the t's decay, the c's decay, everything decays down, and you end up with protons, neutrons, and electrons, um, and neutrinos, so just, just those. They're, they're the end product of all those things. Now, whether such objects like this, I call I for instanton, um, it's, it's a sort of far speculative thing in a way. Dark energy, of course, is also something that we believe is there. In fact, it got the Nobel Prize in 2011 when the expansion of the universe was seen to be accelerating rather than decelerating. So um, it's a ubiquitous, everywhere, extremely low density compared with component of the vacuum. Einstein, when he, when he did his cosmology, um, he, he wanted to have a static universe. He didn't know about the other galaxies. He didn't know about the expansion. He thought the universe was basically static. And he put a, co a term in his equations to make it static. And then, of course, when Hubble in 29 showed the universe was actually expanding, uh, Einstein said, well, damn, we should drop that, drop that equation. But now with the expansion accelerating, again, damn, bring it back, we'll see. So we don't really know what it is. Is it another scalar field? Is it homogeneous or not? Uh, is it like the Higgs, unchanged by the universe expansion? As far as we know, these, these are, these are true, true things. But uh, it has to be, the density has to be just right, so-called Goldilocks effect, because if it had a higher dense, more dark energy would blow the universe apart too soon, less it would collapse, and we happen to be somewhere where it's long enough to, uh, it, it's, it's 30 and something billion years old, so it's long enough for us to be here. And does it have field quanta? Well, there have been some speculations that if it has field quanta, they would naturally be spin zero, charge zero, super weak, um, maybe an extremely small mass, and maybe like tachyonic, meaning that they would always travel faster than the speed of light, which is not necessarily ruled out for such things. Um, so now I come to my time scale of the universe on one slide. So obviously not so easy to do, but here's a timeline. And at the far left end, we have the Planck time, 
which is given by h bar g over c to the fifth squared, and that's 10 to the minus 44 seconds. Here we have the age of the universe, and of course that is not a constant, but it's changing, but pretty slowly on this scale. And now here's we have a second here. I've, and these are all a log scale, of course, and these are the powers of 10. So 10 to the 1, 10 to the 0 is 1 second, that's us. Uh, you can all guess what 2 10 to the 9 seconds is. About my age, about your age, <laughs> roughly. It's about how long we live in seconds, uh, typically. And, um, and then here, here are 10 to the minus 10 seconds, 10 to the minus 20 seconds. And here's the realm of known particle physics, because here's the energy uh, conjugate to that time. So this is now log of energy in time scale. So this is 10 to the, 10 to the, um, 10 to the minus 35. I just see a mistake here. This is, oh, it's, no, it's not a mistake. It's just you can't see the plus. It's a plus sign there, and a plus sign there. It looks pretty feeble there. But so here's, uh, here's the realm of everyday life, if you like, between one second and, and, uh, and 10 to 9 seconds or so. And uh, down here is particle, and I'm going to zoom in on this part of the scale here. The Higgs is around here, um, 100 GeV, typically, 10 to the, um, and then up here, um, we talk about the, the gut scale, the grand unification scale up at, uh, at these very high energies here. If monopoles exist, they're heavy, magnetic monopoles, and they could be up here somewhere as loops. And I've drawn a little cartoon here of an, what an electron looks like with a short exposure. In this case, 10 to the minus 26 seconds. So it doesn't look like an extended object, as far as we know. What you see, if you look at an electron with this very short exposure, you see several electrons and several positrons and one more electron than positron. That's what this is meant to represent because around the electron you see electron-positron pairs popping out of the vacuum. And uh, the closer in you look with the higher um, momentum transfer, the shorter wavelengths, you see more and more of those pairs. And then off to the right here, dark energy may be very low energy, axion condensate very low energy. So let's zoom in on this, uh, this region of par known particle physics. So now that's 10 to the minus 21 seconds to 10 to the plus 20. Um, this is the LHC energy, okay, up here. Um, and that corresponds to 10 to the 29 seconds there. Um, so and here's, so I've drawn here three, three scales, depending on whether you're looking at the vacuum with electromagnetic eyes, meaning with photons, or strong eyes, meaning with gluons, or weak eyes, meaning with Ws. So with electromagnetic eyes, as you zoom in, you start to see, at 1 MeV, you start to see electron-positron pairs. Well, they're there at lower energies, but they become real up here, and quarks and antiquarks in loops appear because they've got electromagnetic charge too, new pairs here, and then we move up, up, up to eventually at a very short time scale, you would see TT bar pairs, top anti top pairs appearing because they've got electric charge too. With the strong eyes, as you zoom in, you start to see, well, uh, as I said, quark anti quark pairs, and then st states that have strong interactions, uh, but are sort of called resonant states, right? The first is the pi on loop, a pi on loop, and then this resonance called the sigma 600. Glue balls are things I'm going to be talking about more, which are still unclear exactly uh, where and how they are, but they have masses of around 2 GeV if they're there, and they probably uh, mix with quark antiquark states. And then you have these other states, chi, chi C0, chi B0. These are states that have no spin, no isotopic spin. They've got positive parity and charge parity. In fact, they've got the vacuum quantum numbers, and they can appear in the vacuum as part of the vacuum spontaneously and then disappear depending on you know, how much time you give them. And then up here is the Higgs boson, which again, if you, if you look at the vacuum short enough time, then you will see, uh, you'll see a Higgs boson can appear. And uh, it'll disappear spontaneously unless you allow it to become real by colliding protons, for example. And I put Higgs there because it couples to gluons through a top loop. So the particles shown have got these vacuum quantum numbers this is isospin and G parity, zero plus, spin and PC parity. So there's a whole rich, rich spectrum in the vacuum there, depending on how you look for it. Um, 
And other things, you know that the vacuum is not nothing. I mean, here's the well-known Casimir force between two, two plates. Um, some things are not showing up quite, but there should be two plates here, and metal plates, and you bring them close together, and long wavelengths are excluded from between these two metal plates, but the wa long wavelengths are allowed outside, and that gives a, 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 an attractive force between the plates, and Casimir, uh, Casimir showed that, that that would be true, the Casimir effect, and you see a diagram here. Long wavelengths between the two metal plates are excluded, but outside you have these, the, the, the electromagnetic fields in the vacuum. And then there's the, lamb, the famous lamb shift. Um, here's lamb. I, he's on a stamp from the St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I don't quite know what his connection there is, but there he is. And uh, he showed that virtual photons uh, or in, inside an atom, for example hydrogen, give rise to a polarization of the vacuum, electron-positron loop, loops that can actually that shift, shift the spectral lines, and that was discovered. And, it's a very strong test of quantum electrodynamics. So the vacuum is teeming with these electromagnetic fluctuations. And uh, another one, which I just put these up because we are um, at Fermilab now doing a new project. Uh, well, it's a, it's a revamped experiment called G-2. This was done at Brookhaven, and here's a, a ring, a superconducting coil, and muons were sent round and round, uh, and they're processing as they go round and the precession depends on their magnetic moment. And the clever thing about this is what you measure is not the magnetic moment, but the difference between the magnetic moment and two. So it's a very precise thing, many decimal places. It agrees pretty well with quantum electrodynamic calculations, which are done by, uh, like a charged particle can emit a photon and reabsorb it, or an electron positron loop, or any other loop that's allowed in the vacuum can be uh, affecting this uh, magnetic moment. Now, uh, they had a, a deviation from what is expected with these detailed calculations, and so it was um, decided to redo this at Fermilab, where with more intense muon beams and, up, and better measurements of the magnetic field and so on. So the coil was sent, it's a single coil, it's a big thing, and it was sent to Fermilab from Brookhaven by ship, and then up the Mississippi, and then by road, and here it's getting a welcoming committee from the local population here at Fermilab, and now it's installed in, in, in a new building at Fermilab, and this was about a year ago. It's now getting ready to run next year to remeasure G minus two, because if there are other loops in here that we don't know about, for example, say you had some charge two or loop or something like that, that would affect it. We really need to see if that is uh, agreeing with the calculations. And here is uh, this how this vacuum polarization affects interaction strengths. And um, it's a bit of a cartoon in a way, but as you go, um, th this is, well, look at this diagram which shows the strong coupling between, let's say, between quarks in a proton. It's called alpha sub s. And as you go up in momentum transfer or down in distance, it gets weaker and weaker. This is called asymptotic freedom. It essentially should go to zero at infinite energy, and that got the Nobel Prize to, uh, for QCD to Pollitzer and Wilczek. And, um, and as you go up down here to large distances, small momentum transfers, you see how sort of, it's pretty poorly measured. I mean, it's not necessarily the most recent, but it gets sort of all hell breaks loose because the strong coupling becomes so strong that your calculations that you can do diagram after diagram blow up. Uh, but for, for some of us, this is a very interesting region where it's now not QCD at large distances, the size of protons and, and bigger, and where the coupling is big. And on the other hand, in electromagnetism, it's the opposite, that as you go to smaller and smaller, the coupling gets weaker. That's called screening. And so asymptotically there, well, it, the reason is because of virtual pairs that you see in. But so quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics have opposite behaviors here. Um, so another picture of this vacuum excitation. Now I'm doing it imagining the laboratory frame where you have a proton target and you bring in a proton, a proton, uh, it's a proton target at rest. You bring in a high energy proton and I put in 1536 and I'm not remembering if this is a Tevatron or the LHC energy but it's much higher energy proton. And then 
in these reactions, the proton that comes in comes flying out with almost the same energy it came in with. Um, the target proton just recoils a bit, and you have a, a state here. I've labeled it G because it could be one of the glue ball states that i am be talking about, produced far, far away um, as time goes on. It becomes very far from the incoming and out, uh, the, the incident and outgoing protons. So this is called a rapidity gap. Um, and it doesn't, it could be a state like a glue ball that has got the vacuum quantum numbers, but, and is there sort of evanescently in the vacuum. But by colliding these protons, the strong fields uh, kick it up into reality, and it becomes a real glue, glue ball state, which we know is not stable. It decays immediately to a pair of pions or kaons or other, other mesons and so on. And then you can also have, at high energies, and we, we're seeing this now, pairs of jets of particles coming out because now the LHC, and also to some extent the Tevatron, we could, we could excite the vacuum to, to higher energies. And now the diag we have diagrams we can calculate those things. But, uh, so here I've just sketched in the electron loop, quark loop, gluon loop, and so on, and a, and a Higgs and a chi there. So now this is now, that was a sketch in the laboratory frame where you have a target pr uh, proton at rest and one coming in. We work now in the, with colliders in the... Uh, in the, in, the, in the center of mass frame, center of momentum frame, where the two protons are coming in. And uh, this is, this axis called rapidity. Rapidity is like a logarithmic uh, version of speed, if you like, only uh, unlike speed, which goes up to the speed of light, this goes forever. And the, the rapidity of the beam is the logarithm of the central mass energy divided by the mass of the proton, or an electron, if you have an electron beam. So when we have, so the, a gap, a rapidity gap, we talk about a gap being no particles at the at LEP. Um, well, uh, LEP was an electron-positron collider at CERN that could focus and sit on the Z boson and study millions of Z bosons. But at the ISR, um, it had a very large gap bet because the electrons have got very small mass, so for a, they have very high rapidity. Their speed is that much closer to the speed of light. Um, as the colliding proton machines went up in energy, the r rapidity separation between the beam particles went from 8.4 at the intersecting storage ring up to 18.6 at the Large Hadron Collider. Now you have a large region, and in elastic scattering, you have an exchange of four momentum across this gap, these, these, these large regions. Um, and what carries that four momentum across? It, carries, it can carry spin, but strictly the spin depends on how uh, much uh, momentum transfer it is, um, but the cross sections. So we still have. Uh, we cannot calculate in, in QCD, which is the theory of strong interactions, but we can't calculate proton-proton elastic scattering, because as I said, the strong coupling gets very big at these low momentum transfers, and the calculations blow up. So that's still unfinished business to calculate elastic scattering. At, um, at, at small momentum transfers um, at, at these high energy machines. So when you have a, a large rapidity gap like these exchanges, the possibilities are the exchange has to have spin one or more than one. Uh, this is, I don't go into this, but, uh, but it has to be charge zero, it has to be a singlet in color, which means it doesn't carry strong color like quarks and gluons do. Um, so uh, a gluon can be exchanged, but it carries color, so you have to cancel it by having another gluon across. So this is a digluon. We call it, we can call it a pomeron, um, after Pomeranchuk, who, uh, uh, who uh, had made theories about these uh, scattering processes. Um, and uh, then it can be a photon, or in principle it could be also a Z or W bo uh, Z boson, but that doesn't happen in practice like this. So. Uh, I should look at the time because I don't want to spend too much on this, but you know, we have QCD as the theory of strong interactions. There's no elementary object that has the right properties to give a large rapidity gap like elastic scattering requires. So you can't exchange an elementary object except a photon, but that's not strongly interacting. So um, in QCD, there's theory called Reggie theory, which we all were taught, but I don't think students now are taught it because it's passe, um, but it's still valid in certain parts of physics like in this. 
It's, it's, um, it's named, uh, well, named after Tullio Reggi, who developed this theory. And he says that scattering amplitudes, if you collide two particles and they scatter, then you write down an amplitude for that scatter. And the amplitude is a complex object that depends on the, mm, on the variables, like the scattering angle and so on. And the scattering amplitudes, he showed, have to be obey certain basic properties. Analyticity, basically, that means that there's no, there's no discontinuities. Crossing symmetry, so you can take a particle from the incoming and make it go outgoing and change it from particle to antiparticle. Uh, and, and then the unitarity, which means basically that you can't have uh, blow, you can't have probabilities greater than one in there. And then Reggie also brought in the idea of complex angular momenta, which makes it so complicated to us, but still that is able to describe a lot of these reactions that QCD still can't describe. And then Pomeranchuk, uh, here's a picture of him, so he actually started as an experimenter, he invented a cooling cell, uh, which got down to some millik or something, I don't know, but uh, the story was that his professor, I think it was Landau, so came in to his lab and found broken glass all over the floor, and he said, Pomeranchuk, are you a theorist? <laughs> because he obviously wasn't going to make it as an experimenter, but he, he, he was a great theorist. So, so then um, we have, before 1970, the strong interactions were described by Reggie theory. We had regions, pomerons as exchanged entities, they're not particles, but now QCD rules. Um, and and uh, space-time, oh, we have a, th a, a branch of QCD called lattice gauge theory, which attempts to calculate things like hadron masses by making space-time on a lattice. So instead of being continuous, it's discrete in space and time, and you make this lattice spacing uh, project it, uh, extrapolate it down to zero lattice spacing. And it does a pretty good job in many ways of calculating ratios of masses like the row mass and the pile mass, but it's very, it takes a lot of computer time. It's not a very transparent sort of thing. And they have got calculations for um, these particles I've been mentioned called globals, which are hadrons that don't have any valence quarks in. Um, but um, and, and they expect to have a scalar global, the lightest one, and a mass of about 1.7 GeV. Um, and it would uh, then presumably mix with quark-antiquark -quark states and so on. Um, now, uh, for a long time, the Pomeron was considered a sort of dirty word. You didn't talk about it too much because people like to go to the highest Q squared, smallest distances. But it's a fundamental part of strong interaction physics. And uh, I think that new phenomena could show up in this sort of physics region where you're now looking at the strong fields at large distances, large space distances, and so on. Um, and this is a diagram showing not elastic scattering, but diff what we call diffractive excitation, where the two protons come in, they're coming in there here, and they exchange form momentum. This one goes out, just losing a bit of energy, but this one is excited up to a state with a mass of, could be a few GV or much bigger, that decays or breaks up into several particles. That's called single diffractive excitation. And you can have it collisions where, and it actually it's not rare at the LHC, it takes up some uh, between 5 and 10 percent of the collisions there. And you can have both protons dissociating like that. But also, and this should be a line showing up here with a proton coming in, both protons come in and both protons go out with only a small loss of energy, creating a state in the middle, called, I call it X, by these two pomerons. So it's like pomeron-pomeron collisions in some sense. And here, I'm, there's very restrictive properties on this, quant this object X. It has to have zero isotopic spin, it has to have even spin, positive parity, and so on and so forth. So it's like a quantum number filter, and it enables you to do, study some hadrons uh, in a way that you can't do otherwise. Um, I call it here, and you'll understand like, why I say that, diffractive excitation of the vacuum, because these states are present in the vacuum. Global is there, can be there as, as a fluctuation. Of course, it doesn't be real and, and unless you give it, you kick it, you allow it to become real. Um, so uh, so it, it's, I, Lo and Nusenov first talked about this Pomeron being a pair of gluons and, and so on, and a color singlet, meaning the color of one is balanced by the color of the other. And now, so I've been involved in this sort of physics since way back at the ISR in the early 70s, where they said that was the first proton-proton collider. And 
you know, it had a square root of S, that's the energy, the center of mass collision energy, 63 GeV. That's two protons with 31 GeV colliding. And, you know, we thought this was really up in the realm of cosmic rays because before, because that's an equivalent energy on a target of 2,000 GeV, and up to then you'd only had like 26, 28 GeV on a target. And we studied things like pi pair production, also k pairs, pp bar pairs, in the center, and we measured the two protons going out, and that helped us select these very clean events. And I'll show you a spectra that, uh, that we saw, but uh, we couldn't say we discovered glue balls, but there's clearly structures in the spectrum. And then when you go up to the LHC now, 13,000 GeV, much higher energy, and now you can produce a pair of W bosons in the center, and there's an interesting sort of uh, balance between that diagram and this diagram, where the Ws are like you know, the quanta of the, of the weak field, and, and these, these are called strong hadrons here. And then it's also theoretically expected that you could produce a Higgs boson by ex ex exciting the vacuum into the, to a real Higgs boson, and it decays to W plus, W minus, or depending on its, or, or, or other channels like BB bar and so on and so forth. Actually, we now know the Higgs is 125 GeV. It won't go to two real Ws, but it can go to one real and one a virtual, we call it off shell W. And in, in the middle, you have the Tevatron. And the Tevatron in CDF, we did a series of experiments uh, where we saw in the central region here an electron pair coming from gamma-gamma collision, or a muon pair, gamma-gamma. This is photons coming from the cloud of the protons. And it's like using the tevatron as a gamma-gamma collider. The gammas are coming along in the electromagnetic field of the protons. And your gamma-gamma goes to E pairs or mu pairs. Tau pairs we didn't see, but that's because they're much harder to see. We also saw what we call exclusive, J-Psi and Psi-2S. These are in the center. I'll, I'll show you some pictures of that. And then chi sub c, which as I said, the chi sub c is a cc bar state, charm anti-charm, but it has the quantum numbers of the vacuum, zero plus, zero plus, plus. And, and, um, and then, well, we didn't, we didn't see epsilons there, um, we, and we saw jets and so on. And up at the LHC, you now go to these higher re re regimes here. So, um, and here's some, some pictures, history. So at the ISR, this was the best final experiment at the ISR. It's a pity it came late. Axial field spectrometer. This is a magnet that we had. Um, it's like Helmholtz coil, so it gives you a solenoidal type field, but instead of being parallel, it's blown up like that. So it's actually interesting because you get a good field integral independent of direction, but more important is you don't have a coil in front of what goes outside, which was a calorimeter. And this calorimeter was a square box, uranium plates with scintillator plates, hundreds of photomultiplier tubes, and that we, um, that was the first calorimeter, uh, which was called calorimeter to measure the energy of hadrons going in there. And with this, we co-discovered high NT jets. Inside this guy was a, diff a drift chamber. This was half of it. It's got uh, 40 wires uh, going radially outwards, so we could get the tracks in there. And then, so this we did uh, a global search at the ISR with four proton detectors. CDF is here, and uh, we did some experiments there, which I will show. And here's now CMS. You see the, the growth in scale. Here's a person down here. And uh, of course, it's very, very impressive. But CMS, as you know, mostly runs with very high luminosity with 30, 40 collisions per bunch crossing every 25 nanoseconds. It's not very appropriate for this, although you can try and do it. So I, I may be repeating myself here, but trying to excite the vacuum with photons, you know, you can't, you can't make a, an E plus E minus with a photon because of EP conservation, forbids it, except for these very short times. Of course, you can do it if you have two, and then you can make it real. Or you can make uh, the photon convert to an E plus E minus with another photon coming from the field of a nucleus, for example. So this is pair creation in a nuclear field. Um, and here's a whole hierarchy of things that you can do with higher and higher energies. Um, now, here's another example from... Um, from the cosmos of this process, where um, gamma rays, for example, gamma rays in the cosmos with 10 to the 17 electron volts, okay, 10 to the fifth uh, uh, GeV, or uh, they can hit a microwave background photon in the cosmic microwave background, and 
Be and, and the total energy is enough to make an electron-positron pair. So uh, that is like a, ba a, a barrier to e higher energy photons. They're going the, the, the space, is, space is opaque to them because uh, they can make e electron pairs. Actually, the GZK cutoff is also with protons coming in. And the protons on the cosmic background can be excited and make a delta that goes to pi, p pi and so on. So the Auger project has been measuring the alpha extreme end of, of cosmic rays because of the microwave background, cutting them off. Um, so here's what I mentioned about photon beams, tevatron. Um, uh, actually, photons coming along with the protons. And well, I, I've got to skip with this, but here's, here's just a, a collision with an electron positron coming out and nothing else. And is it, this is the calorimeter. You see an electron and a positron, and there's nothing else in the event. The protons go down the beam pipe, and these events uh, we, we, ha we, sh we show, this is the first time we've one seen this process in a hadron-hadron collider, and uh, we showed that this is masses above 10 GeV for the pairs. We saw electron pairs and muon pairs with masses up to 70 GeV. The LHC is now doing better than this, but this was a pretty nice program. So, you know, all the, the, these, these type of experiments, they all agree with quantum electrodynamics as we, as we, as we know, so I mean, you may you may say, uh, you know, so, so what? But, of course, you can always look for surprises, but we used to consider this a luminosity calibration at the LHC. We no longer do because there's a lot of more uncertainties and you can do a better measurement with scanning beams. Um, calibrating forward proton spectrometers is great because you see these two, say, muons, and then you know if it was a reaction like this, you know the two proton momenta, or the P and P bar momenta. And if they, you see them in, the, in your spectrometer, then uh, that's calibrating them and checking them. And at the LHC, we're now up in the realm where we can see W pairs being produced. And you could see a pair of something else being produced, but uh, supersymmetric particles uh, with spin zero are not likely to produce because the cross-section depends on the spin as well as the charge. If nature was kind enough to give us a particle with charge two and a spin even greater than one, then that would be great. We'd see that in these type of experiments. So. Um, moving along, so ISR, okay, we, w this was the beginning of the ISR. I, I already said that we had colliding beams of 31 GeV. Um, actually, there's a huge contrast with the LHC. When the LHC turned on, these big experiments were re there ready to go. When the ISR turned on, there were no experiments there. Um, some, some detectors were rushed in one evening to put in four scintillation counters to see collisions. But the first other experiment was a toy train set, actually, it wasn't this one, but it went in on rails with emulsions on the tracks, on the, on the, um, on the, carry, on the carts, and it measured the angular distribution of produced particles. That's a total distraction from this talk. But anyway, let me move on, um, because I don't have so much time. Here is um, the axial field spectrometer back at the ISR, and I already showed those pictures. But we, we, we did discover jets, high-ET jets produced in quark-quark and quark-gluon collisions. Um, and these are a couple of pictures of so-called Lego plots showing the jets when you had a trigger with large total energy. But unfortunately, by the time we got there, the uh, SPS, unfortunately for us, the SPS collider was also coming on the air. And they saw these. We actually published in the same issue of Physics Letters. But, um, but th they sort of stole our thunder a bit. But we had this nice drift chamber. And there we could add very forward tracking chambers for protons coming out to see a pair of pions or so coming in the central region. And with that, um, we saw, OK, and we were looking for, for glue balls. Now, um, so uh, this hadron spectrum, as I said, it's a quantum number filter. It picks out even spin, neutral particles, and so on. And um, if, you have, if you have particles that are like mesons, but without any quarks and antiquarks, and we call those glue balls, then they should be produced this way. So this is an ongoing program to try to understand the glue ball sector here. Now, there's also, you may have heard of models of hadrons, string models, where a meson is an open string, and each end is a quark and antiquark. And a baryon is, a, is like a Y with the three ends, all quarks. And then a glue board in this model would be a closed loop of string because it has no ends. It's got no quarks or antiquarks. So in that model, you, you make it a loop. 
And in principle, you could have a loop, a barred loop, with, with a, 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 a color flux line across like that. And then that topology of glue string uh, would be relatively stable. It would break apart by breaking uh, these three lines and making a baryon and antibaryon. So proton, antiproton, or lambda, lambda bar, or, or something like that. Um, here's just, here's just, well, it's a busy slide, but it's a table all the allowed states from the particle data group uh, tables, and there's spin zero states and spin two states, and I put notes about these things, but I don't think I really have any time to talk about them, uh, except that, you know, the lattice gauge theory suggests that these F0, 1500 or 1710 could have a large global component in them, even if they're not fully, fully globals, and then down the spin two state you expect to be around about here. And there's not so much known about those states. They really need to be studied more. Um, here's what we did in the ISR with, with, with our pi pi spectrum. It's pretty exciting to see this cliff here, which is, which is caused by a resonance called the F0980. It shows up as a drop rather than a peak because the cross section is already about as big as it can be there. And it's, not, it's, it's a rather special thing where you have this just two particles all all by itself. And then this structure is still not really understood, although, uh, although it's seen in other experiments now also at the LHC. And one thing they did at the ISR, a very versatile machine, was they did alpha-alpha collisions. And, and in alpha-alpha collisions, we saw these alphas coming out quasi-elastic, but not really elastic. We could tell there's charge two and so on, with a pion pair produced in the middle. So this is absolutely coherent. It means, you know, the alphas stay together. That means it's got to be like coherent vacuum excitation. And, and the, the, the spectra is compatible with being the same in PP. Now we move on to the, to the Tevatron, and, and here's what we... Now, at the Tevatron, in CDF, we've done this sort of physics, but without seeing the protons. Unfortunately, we don't have the proton detectors, but we require large so-called rapidity gaps. A pair of pions in the central region, rapidity less than one, and nothing else seen out to a rapidity of 5.9. So that's a gap in rapidity of 4.9, which corresponds to an uh, exchange of photons or pomerons, in this case mostly pomerons. And you see, you see there, there, is, there is structure in this. We go out here, there's about, uh, um, about uh, 300,000 events in this plot, and then here's a, 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 another plot that is still preliminary. But in this, we didn't identify the pions as pions. We just said the hadrons, probably they're mostly pions, 90% of pions. Here we've actually identified them, so we pay a price. But you see there's structures here that we just need to understand. Now this is not corrected for acceptance, so that's a job we have to do. But this is the game going on now, and also in, in uh, CMS. Um, and here is, uh, okay, Chi-C, we observed Chi-C produced by itself. The idea is that you have a charm loop here between two gluons and it can produce a chi-c, which decays to j-psi, going to mu pairs, and a photon. And we saw this with nothing else at all in CDF. And we measured, we measured the cross-section for that. And the reason why this was most interesting was because if you have a top loop here instead of a charm loop, it can couple to a Higgs. So this was the idea that you could produce a Higgs this way at the LHC. PP goes to PP plus a Higgs in the middle with a top loop here. And by measuring this, we could sort of check the theoretical calculations for the Higgs production that way. Um, this was from CDF. This was a beautiful plot, I think, of the J-psi and the psi primes, which is photoproduction. That's gamma pomeron. And then this continuum, which is gamma gamma to mu pairs. And um, that all showed that it was working quite well. Um, interesting would be exclusive Z photoproduction, because it's allowed by quantum numbers, of course, but the Z is very heavy. So you have this diagram where the photon fluctuates to a quark-antiquark -quark pair, um, and that scatters with a Pomeron exchange and becomes a real Z boson. So you've got PP, the LHC, PP to PP plus a Z. And here it's, it looks nice to have a photon, Pomeron, Z vertex. Of course, inside there, there's things going on that you'd like to know, loops, loops in there. Now, we searched for this at the, uh, at the Tevatron. We didn't find it, and we didn't expect to, but at the LHC, we should see these exclusive Z's productions. Um, and um, so and also the other, another thing which was also quite exciting, and D0 did this as well, um, was exclusive jets. So you see here an event with two jets, very little else, 
And in our case, we had the antiproton detected in, Roman, in, in uh, forward spectrometer. And uh, this also could constrain models about, of, of, uh, of this sort of production. Um, and here now, it's, now this is coming to the LHC. So CMS and TOTEM together. We had a run in 2012 with low luminosity, and it was not a very long run, but we selected events as a trigger that had uh, the two protons seen in the totem detectors and at least two jets in the central region above 20 GeV. That's quite high PT for, for us. And then we required, I mentioned this particularly, forward shower counters. These are along the beam pipes. And the forward shower counters are actually, Michael Murray here uh, worked on these. And now when they go back in, which we hope they will do, um, we're, we're sharing a readout with the zero ZDC calorimeter uh, that M Michael Murray and company have been working on. But these events, you see, uh, we got in this short period some dozens of events with uh, two jets, you see, or three jets here, and, and essentially nothing else. So these, these are supposed to be gluon jets, theoretically, and these can be glue, glue, three gluons, or one gluon and two quarks. And if the two quarks, there should be uh, democratic between up, down, strange, charm, and beauty. So this is now starting up and will be, and now we have this new project called CTPPS, CMS and TOTEM, Precision Proton Spectrometers, starting up. Now it's in, included in CMS uh, uh, system, and data acquisition, and so on, and, and starting to work. And we'll be doing exclusive jets up to above 300 GV here. Um, I should finish soon, but one thing that we did that in CDF, which is very nice, I think, uh, is exclusive two photons. So these are events where you have two photons produced and nothing else, uh, except the proton and the antiproton go down the beam pipe. And, and it's, the diagram is like this exclusive Higgs production, but it's any loops in here, mainly up and charm loops in there. And we saw these events with two photons, nothing else. And it's not been done elsewhere um, yet. CMS did a search. Uh, but whereas in CDF we required a photon with energy above 2.5 GV, in CMS it was up at 5.5 GV for various trigger reasons and so on. So the cross section is lower. And there's the upper limit, and here's the theory. Whereas here was our measurement, and here's the theory. But this is a remarkable collision because the protons come in, the protons come out, and you see two photons coming out in the middle with high energy. And uh, it's um, now. Uh, so CMS now, as I said, we're now moving up into the realm of W pairs. And, uh, and so we're, if you like, I think of it like exciting a W loop in the vacuum. But of course, the diagrams you calculate using Feynman diagrams like this, gamma, gamma to W pair, or here as well. And here's a cortic coupling with two photons and two Ws coupled together. And uh, it's very interesting to study that coupling and see if it's a standard model-like, because it's a window to beyond standard model physics. And here is the measurements from CMS. Um, and uh, you don't have to look at scales, but we just are cons completely consistent with the standard model at the moment. But this project, where we measure the two protons down the beam pipe, uh, is the best way, in fact, the only good way of measuring gamma, gamma, w, w, just like that, that particular one. Here's, here's uh, you see these, uh, the blue data here. It's not a lot of events, a large background, but we've got 15 events. This is published, and we're working on more with a background of, of below five there. And then, um, OK, so uh, just the, so, well, I put this in. You can look at it afterwards. I call it the gap and exclusive landscape. At, this is actually at 8 TV. I'd like to update it. But these are cross sections, 100 millibarns. And here's the total inelastic cross section. Here's one millibarn. Here's a diffractive cross section. And here's like 100 microbarns, which is this double Pomeron cross section. And then as you come down here, you're seeing central jets and so on. And here's the Chi C. Here's a different, these are photo production and so on. And, and you see Higgs 125 JF is down here. So it's very way down. But uh, the present CTPPS is not capable of seeing the Higgs because the two protons are too close into the collision region. Um, so the minimum mass we can see is about 300 to 400 GeV. To see the Higgs this way, we'd have to put new detectors 420 meters downstream. Um, which I think would be, would be a well worthwhile thing. It has more technical issues in it. But the Higgs is an important enough particle that we should 
study it any way we can. I mean, before the Higgs was discovered, we thought we could measure its mass and spin and everything this way, but uh, that wasn't to be like that. Um, so, but here's the ultimate vacuum excitation, if you like, is producing a Higgs this way. Um, and, uh, okay, uh, so, well, the thing is, if, if, you, if we had this at 420 meters, it started forward protons at 420 meters, and really a series of meetings started in 2005, um, and Christoph Ryan was part of these, and, uh, and so they were in Manchester, and that way we could see the two protons coming out, and by measuring the protons precisely, you could get the Higgs with a resolution of 2 GV per event. Now, we're getting that other ways, but um, seeing, seeing the Higgs this way is perhaps a unique way of really nailing its, its C parity and parity and showing that they've got to be positive and so on. So my final remarks here. Um, the Large Hadron Collider program is mainly, well, it's PP collisions mainly, plus pr proton lead and so on, but to PP to study the highest masses, smallest distances, like 10 to the minus 4 times the radius of a proton, that needs the highest energy and luminosity for Atlas and CMS, and then there's LHCB and ALICE that do other uh, lower luminosity physics, charm and B physics and so on. And this is, I call it a secondary program, lead, 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 heavy ions, lead, large volumes of strongly inter interacting matter. Um, I use this word quagma, which didn't really take off, but uh, it's quark, gluon, plasma. I think quagma is a short, short way of saying that. And then there's a textbook, Physics Total Cross Sections. This is using special days type running. Um, and there's not much, uh, I think, focus on light flavor and no flavor, that is, global hadrons, uh, except what we can do almost sort of parasitically together with that. It's unfinished business. If we could study these double polymer experiments with not just pi pi, but kk and phi phi and k star, k star, and, and so on, with really high statistics and phase shift analysis and so on, we ought to be able to resolve this issue of, of globals. So, um, yeah, I just put this in uh, Planck scale string theory, a graviton is a closed loop, and glue ball is a closed loop of QCD string. It's just a nice picture, <laughs> okay. So my summary is that, uh, okay, the vacuum is teeming with states from electron positron loops um, to, to, the, to the Higgs, presumably. Um, I, I had maybe there, but I probably wrote that before we found the Higgs. If you truly understand the vacuum, you'll understand all of fundamental physics. I think maybe you, you have to go much smaller than the Higgs to do that. But uh, theoretically, experimenting, we can excite it with a, with a pair of hammers, photons, or gluons, or Ws. And then um, we're now using the LHC as a gamma-gamma collider, and a glue-glue collider with tiny but very high-precision tracking detectors, which are the ones, this CTPPS. And, um, and and to do it in low luminosity or low pileup modes uh, would be appropriate for these high cross-section things. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions? Wake up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, John. So uh, years ago, Cavitron uh, of this kind we discussed, uh, there, there was a perception that you're aware of that uh, soft physics, polymer and physics, and so on, that the assay couldn't find anything new. And, uh, I think that maybe that's reversed now at the LHC because you have some of this with practically no back. Could you comment on finding new physics uh, in, in events where there's very low vacuum? Yes, yeah. No, it's true. I mean, for, for a while on CDF, I was a QCD convener, but everybody thought that QCD means in the Tevatron studying the highest ET jets, and, and, and I was arguing, and I said, <laughs> actually, the frontier of QCD that we really don't understand so well is not the high Q squared end, it's the low Q squared end. And there, there is. Um, they say, well, why do you need the LHC energy for study things with a few GeV? Actually, um, the a key thing is with this particular reaction of what I call vacuum excitation, uh, the LHC is great because you can have very big rapidity gaps. You see the two protons, and and we still do not, you know, you still, if you look at look at papers, reviews about blue balls in the last couple of years, they still say 
we haven't understood the global sector and the, the isoscalar scalar sector of mesons is still not understood. And I think that's, that's a pity, a wrong. I think we should really understand that. And I do think that if one devoted the right time, and it means not just the right conditions, but the right triggers and so on, to, to doing this sort of physics, we have a chance of understanding these, these states, which is somehow related to confinement. I mean, of, or, or, and all sorts of, um, I'm not saying we'll understand confinement by this, but, but it's, it's unfinished, I say it's unfinished. And, and now, so, you know, when the ISR started, everybody thought the particles will go forward. You know, that's where you need a split field magnet and so on. And, 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 and it turned out that hyper-T physics came up and was more interesting. And now the forward regions got completely neglected in many ways. And here's another thing that I, that I, I, I don't know if I have this, uh, no. Um, it's a bit off this subject, but I w there was a cosmic ray conference recently, and I was asked to talk about accelerator physics results for cosmic rays. And I realized then that the only data on forward hadron production, when I mean pions, kaons, PEP bar, um, and by forward I mean Feynman X between 0.1 and 0.8, the only data was from the ISR, root S of 62 up to 62 GB. And that's way below the knee in the cosmic spectrum. Now we're doing cosmic ray physics way above the knee, and there's many models for showers in the atmosphere, but they don't have data to, and, and it's not, you know, it, it, that region's been neglected, it wasn't done about the ISR, uh, uh, this San Collider, the Tevatron, not the LHC. The LHC doesn't have any detectors to measure forward hadron production, except the Roman parts, which is, you know, above 0.9 in X, et cetera. So, but there's a way of doing it, and I had a workshop a year ago at CERN about an idea for an experiment to actually measure and identify pions, kaons, and protons at the LHC over this whole Feynman X region. But um, it's hard to excite people about that, except the cosmic ray people. They say, oh, this would be great, you know, if we could have these measurements. And it could be that there's actually interesting new phenomena to show up there, you know. I mean, Brodsky has been saying for a long time that charm should be heavily produced in the forward direction. Um, and um, so, but I realized from my CMS experience that CMS is not going to do that. Um, I mean, it's an add-on to an existing experiment. CMS and Atlas won't. LHCB or ALICE could become interested in that. ALICE because it gives them um, you know, more coverage um, for also for heavy iron. It gives them a PP program that they don't really have a good one in a way. And, um, and LHCB extends their coverage for charm because you can do, you can do very forward D0s, like a D0 to K pi. I don't mean the experiment, I mean the particle. <laughs> um, going down the beat, things like that. So, it's a neglected area, um, and uh, it's not perturbative QCD, but there's an enormous effort going into calculating hadron masses with lattice gauge theory, right? And yet, uh, you ask these guys to calculate you know, a Reggie trajectory, QCD, no, <laughs> I can't do it. And yet, you take a reaction like pi minus p to pi zero n, simple two-body reaction, and Reggie phenomenology describes it very well. I say it's a challenge to QCD to see what you can say about that reaction. They can't do it, but they say it's the theory of strong interactions. Yeah, it's true. And it's, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think there are quite a lot of uh, yeah, opportunities. I think uh, that's with new dis discoveries, no? and uh, now you know also with the proton, proton, pro you know, uh, ion, yeah. pro heavy ion program. Yeah. 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 Okay. So thank you very much uh, for your colleague. You're welcome.